Hi and welcome to another online lecture for General Physics 2. This one is dealing with the topics of standing waves and waves at boundaries. And in fact, before we get into either of those, there's, oh, I don't know, six or eight conceptual questions about the behavior of waves uh, in various media, mostly on a string. Um, they're conceptual questions to, again, help us practice the things that we've been learning so far. But if you feel like you have a good handle on that, feel free to skip ahead into this lecture uh, into where it starts talking about standing waves. Uh, for those of us that are continuing on, here's a question. A person creates a single pulse on a string. The pulse is moving to the right. If you advance the movie one frame, the knot at point A would be what? In the same place, vertically higher, vertically lower, to the right of its current position, or to the left of its current position. Here, as always, I would encourage you to pause the lecture and see if you can uh, predict the answer and then uh, restart it to see what my response is. But A, being on the leading side of the pulse, the pulse is traveling left to right down the string, is in a place where the pulse is pulling the spring above equilibrium. Uh, so an instant later, essentially, this whole pulse shape will be shifted a little bit to the right and point A on the string should be vertically higher than it is uh, right now. Importantly, this is a transverse pulse, and so there is no movement of uh, point A on the string either to the right or to the left of its current position. If you have the person generating a new pulse like the first, but she moves her hand up and down more quickly, what does that do to the pulse? Does it make it the same, same size, taller, shorter, wider, or narrower? And it turns out in that situation that the pulse is going to be narrower um, if you move it up and down more quickly, but presumably you move it up and down to the same height. You keep the pulse the same amplitude, but uh, going up and down more quickly takes less time to produce that wave pulse, and so you end up producing a narrower wave pulse that travels down the string. Uh, obviously, if you do the reverse and you move your hand up and down more slowly, the pulse is going to get wider as a result of that. Uh, if a person generates a new pulse like the first but moves her hand up further, the pulse would be what? The correct answer is two, taller, and we've already alluded to that in the um, discussion on the previous slide. If you go up higher, you displace the spring to a greater, or a string rather, to a greater position initially. Uh, and that's going to give you increased amplitude uh, to this wave, so you're going to get a taller pulse. Apologies for the coffee maker gurgling in the background of this. Uh, if a person generates a new pulse like the first, but the string is tightened, what will the new pulse do? Hopefully, when you've been playing around with springs and making pulses on springs, or even uh, from the standing wave lab, you've seen this as well, if you increase the... Um, tension in the string, this makes a new pulse travel faster down the string. So the correct answer here is number two. If you lower the frequency of a wave on a string, you will do what? Lower its speed, increase its wavelength, lower its amplitude, shorten its period, or none of the above. Well, frequency is connected to period. Recall that frequency and periods are inverses of one another, and so if you actually make the frequency a smaller number, you make the period a longer number. So 4 would be correct if you uh, made it long, uh, lengthen its period, but um, that's not the case. Uh, in terms of the amplitude, lowering the frequency, uh, again, would mean oh, when you're generating waves on a spring, shaking your hand back and forth less frequently uh, and so that has no direct bearing on the amplitude as long as you continue to move your hand the same distance relative to equilibrium that you've always been doing. Similarly, you don't change the speed of the wave because the speed of the wave is fixed by two things. The, the medium with which, uh, through which it's traveling, um, actually, I, I suppose in some ways just one thing, um, but the medium through which it's traveling when we're talking about waves on a string or spring it's the tension that that string or spring is under and the mass density of that string or spring. If we don't affect either of those, we don't change its speed. And because speed is the product of frequency and wavelength, if you lower the frequency while keeping the same speed, uh, you get to the correct answer, number two, and the wavelength is increased. A couple of questions about the superposition effects that we've been observing. 
If we have two pulses moving toward one another as shown, what will we see when these pulses overlap? And the correct answer here is picture B. Notice that the pulses are not the same width as each other, um, so there's no way they can completely cancel out in any fashion. Uh, this one is three units wide, but only one unit below equilibrium. This is one unit wide, but three units above equilibrium. And so at some point, when the middle of this pulse is in the same place as the middle of this pulse, the net displacement of the string in the middle portion will be two blocks above equilibrium because uh, the bottom pulse pulls one block below e equilibrium, top pulse pulls three uh, blocks above equilibrium, and the net result is two blocks above equilibrium in the middle there. And then the ends just has the features of the bottom pulse because the top pulse is not in those locations to affect the shape of the spring. Realistically, um, the shape of the spring would be something more like E, though with a smaller amplitude, because you can't make rectangular pulses on a spring. However, they're easier to make predictions about, so we start with that as our model. How about these two waves? If you have these two waves, um, moving through the water at the same time, what would the surface of the water look like at this instant in time? So we're seeing these waves as a function of position. If they were in the same place at the same time, what would the surface of the water look like? Well, notice on the left here, I go above equilibrium and then below equilibrium. Here I go below equilibrium and above equilibrium. So this portion is a, is a place where I would get the two waves to cancel. Here I go below equilibrium and below equilibrium above equilibrium and above equilibrium. Here they would add and make uh, greater displacement of the string or spring, or I guess they're said to be water waves in this problem. Um, and so the correct picture is D here, where I get them to cancel out or essentially cancel out, uh, where the left two pulses are overlapping and add up to even greater amplitude, uh, where the right two pulses are overlapping. A string and a wire, each 10 meters long, are stretched by the same tension of 30 newtons. The string has a mass of 2.4 times 10 to the minus 3 kilograms, and the wire has a mass of 1.9 times 10 to the minus 3 kilograms. Wave will, waves will travel faster along the string, the wire, neither. There's a tie or there's not enough information to determine this. The correct answer is going to be uh, the wire. And you don't actually need the numbers to, to get uh, make sense of this problem. You just need the relationship that relates wave speed, uh, tension on that string or spring, and mass density. And wave speed is equal to the square root of the tension divided by the mass density. So all we need to realize for this problem is that these two have the same tension, so that's not going to be the, the factor that affects them. Uh, and that wave speed is indirectly related to uh, mass density. So the bigger the mass density, the, the slower the speed and vice versa. They both have the same length, so the thing that has less mass, the wire, is going to have less mass density, and that in turn produces waves with higher speeds. If you wanted to increase the speed of waves along the wire, what could we do? Use a shorter length of wire, increase the tension in the wire, both one and two or none of the above. And the correct answer here is to do number two, increase the tension in the wire. Using a shorter length of wire would mean the waves would get from one end of the wire to the other faster, but while they were traveling along the wire, they wouldn't have any different speed uh, than they did in a longer piece of wire. The only two factors, again, that affect wave speed on a spring, string, or wire uh, or similar system are the tension and the mass density of that, both of which are, are characteristic properties of that object. And as we'll see in every situation where we look at waves, which is primarily going to be light, um, that the material that those waves move through is what determines the speed of those waves. So standing waves are a special phenomena of sending pulses down a spring or string in two directions and having them overlap with each other. And this is a uh, free GIF stolen from the Wikimedia Commons. Uh, I'm not sure how it's going to translate onto the Panopto recording and whether or not you'll be able to see the animation here. So certainly, if not, and you want to look at this, the URL is down at the bottom of this screen. Uh, but I have 
two waves and in my colorblind state it looks like a oh, grayish greenish wave traveling to the right and a yellowish light greenish wave traveling to the left probably have both of those colors wrong um, and they are continually interfering with one another and so in some regions like right here they are adding up and making larger amplitude oscillation than they would normally but in other nearby locations they are always completely canceling each other out and where they always completely cancel each other out we get no net displacement of the spring or string uh, and those are the nodes that we've observed in lab so we can characterize uh, standing waves uh, by predicting for example the frequency of various standing wave patterns and that's typically how this is approached so if I have an oscillator where I have a node on one end and a node on the other end and I'm in the first um, pattern that I can observe at the lowest possible frequency that is a corresponding corresponds to a standing wave pattern I get a lot of oscillation in the middle of the string and little to no oscillation on the end of the string and this is the first frequency at which I produce a standing wave pattern for a given string and so the string in the middle is, is bouncing up and down back and forth but there's very little movement on the ends of the string can increase the frequency a little bit and now I get a situation where I have two regions where there's a lot of oscillations we call those anti-nodes uh, and now there's a node in the middle of those two keep increasing the frequency a little bit more suddenly we have two nodes in the middle of three anti-nodes uh, but again we typically count these end nodes as half each so that we keep the number of nodes and anti-nodes the same when we're turning this into a mathematical representation recall that wave speed is the product of wave frequency and wave length and so uh, here this frequency is f this frequency turns out to be twice the frequency this frequency turns out to be three times the frequency to produce the third standing wave pattern so speed is frequency times wavelength symbolically here that means frequency is speed divided by the wavelength can we predict what the frequency is of this standing wave pattern well if you look at this uh, this first pattern corresponds to a situation where the wavelength would be uh, twice what is shown here uh, and so the wavelength would be two times whatever the length of the string is in other words if I start here and travel along one of these waves I go to a maximum displacement and back to equilibrium that's only half of a wavelength I would need to then go below equilibrium and back to equilibrium to produce a full wavelength of this pattern so in the lowest mode the uh, the length of this pattern uh, represents one half of a wavelength or you can say the wavelength is equal to two times the length of a string when you get to the second pattern this is in fact one complete wavelength uh, and so the wavelength here is equal to L the length of the string here now I get one and a half wavelengths fit in that space so that means the wavelength itself is two-thirds of the length of the string and you could keep doing this and show that the next would be the wavelength would be one half of the length of the string and the pattern continues well let's rewrite those a little bit uh, so we could rewrite that as 2 over 1 times L 2 over 2 times L 2 over 3 times L 2 over 4 times L and as you might have picked up we could keep per, uh, reproducing that pattern 2 over 5 2 over 6 2 over 7 etc and predict what the wavelength would be for each of these standing wave modes that means we can write it more generally we can just say the wavelength of the nth mode is 2 over n times L and L n is just a number 1 2 3 4 but it has to be an integer number um, so let's plug that into uh, the expression for frequency up here frequency is speed divided by wavelength but we've just deduced that wavelength is 2 over n times L the length of the string got a denominator in a denominator so you can take it up to the numerator and rewrite it as n the number of nodes in or anti nodes times v the speed of the wave on a string uh, over 2l and v is related to the tension in the string and the mass density in the string so we can actually replace the wave speed with those physical things that we can measure about the system and arrive at what we showed in the lab that the frequency of a standing wave pattern can be predicted by multiplying the number of the mode that you want um, 
uh, times the square root of the tension and then dividing that by 2 times the length of the string uh, times the square root of the mass density of the string. So let's solve a standing wave problem and show how we might use that relationship. You have a string with a mass of 13.5 grams. You stretch the string with a force of 9.33 newtons giving it a length of 1.87 meters. Then you vibrate the string transversely at precisely the frequency that corresponds to its fourth normal mode, that is, at its fourth harmonic. What is the wavelength of the standing wave that you create in the string, and what is the frequency? All right, well, uh, we're going to assume both ends are fixed, so I'm just sketching a picture of what I mean by this fourth mode right here. Uh, that means I get one, two complete wavelengths in here, or one or rather, one antinode, two antinodes, three antinodes, four antinodes, half plus one plus one plus one plus half equals four nodes as well. Uh, the wavelength, therefore, is one half of the overall string length. So the wavelength is half of that 1.87 meters. That's 0.935 meters. The wave speed is determined by the wave speed equals square root of frequency or tension rather divided by the mass density relationship. And we know that for any wave, speed is equal to frequency times wavelength. Frequency is therefore speed divided by wavelength, and that's equal to uh, the square root of the, the tension force divided by the mass density all over the wavelength. We've already worked out what the wavelength is, and the problem tells us uh, what the tension is, and what the mass is, and what the length is, so we can deduce all of those other pieces. The tension is the 9.33 newtons. The mass density, which we would need to convert into the standard units of kilograms over meters, would be 0 0.0135 kilograms over 1.87 meters. Throw all that into the square root and take that all over the, uh, the wavelength of this pattern, which is 0.935 meters and you end up with uh, 38.4 hertz. So the fourth mode of oscillation for this particular system uh, would require oscillation at 38.4 hertz to produce this standing wave pattern that you see on the string. Uh, as we wrap up, just a few words about boundaries. We've talked about what happens when uh, two waves meet in terms of superposition. They either add to make a larger amplitude wave or cancel out to make a smaller or no amplitude wave. And we've also talked about what happens when a pulse encounters uh, a fixed end. So if we send a pulse into a place where the uh, string, rope, spring, what have you, is attached to the wall, the reflected pulse will be sent back the other direction, but it'll be inverted relative to equilibrium. If it comes in above equilibrium, it will go out below equilibrium and vice versa. Uh, if, however, we have free end and we send a pulse in uh, to a spring or through a spring that's connected to a, a ring and it can slide freely on a rod, what we notice is that while it's reflecting, it gets an even larger amplitude and the reflected pulse is sent back in the opposite direction on the same side of equilibrium as the incoming pulse traveled in. Well, what happens if a wave encounters the boundary between two different media? Uh, what's going on there? Well, uh, the boundary is what we call the point where two different media meet. So in the case of a wave on a spring, we might connect one of the springs that we had in class to, say, a slinky, which has a much different mass density because it's coiled in a different diameter. Um, so for a spring or string, it's two different springs, or a spring and a string, a string and a rope, anything like that. Uh, sound, you can talk about sound waves moving from air to water, ground to air, air to a different temperature air, etc. Um, seismic waves, uh, you can talk about waves moving from ground to water or through different layers of a ground, and so seismologists uh, look at how, say, earthquake waves, both the S and P waves, which I'm not going to get into what those are right now, uh, move through various parts of the earth and allow for us to detect uh, locations of earthquakes. Uh, light waves from air to water, glass to air, etc., and we're much more about that in a day or two. Uh, radio waves, how does the uh, ray wave shift moving from the antenna to the air, the air to the antenna, or through different um, uh, temperatures or uh, other features of air. Uh, 
So there's all kinds of situations in, in our life where waves travel from one material into another material, and that's where we want to move next in our study, what happens to waves when they do that. So we're going to uh, limit our study to springs and strings and help them uh, use them to help us build a model of what's happening. Turns out when a wave encounters a boundary, two things happen to it. Part of the wave gets transmitted and sent on into the new material, and part of the wave is reflected at that boundary and sent back in the original material that the wave was in to start with. The transmitted wave keeps its same general shape uh, moving into the new material, but it might change its wavelength depending on how fast the wave travels in the new material. So its wave speed uh, in the new material is often affected, and that in turn affects the wavelength. If a wave moves from a more dense to a less dense region, however, the reflected wave uh, ends up mimicking free end reflection. So uh, if you're going from more dense to less dense, the portion of the wave that gets reflected back and stays in the more dense medium uh, ends up not experiencing a phase shift at the boundary and heading back, if we're talking springs and strings, on the same side of equilibrium as the incoming pulse did. If we have a wave moving from a less dense region to a more dense region, however, uh, the reflected wave mimics fixed end reflection where the reflected wave moves back as if it had bounced off a wall and the reflected wave has switched sides of equilibrium if we're talking springs and strings more general generally we say that it has undergone a phase shift so the tutorial that we're going to get into next is going to help us build a model for predicting what happens to wave behavior at boundaries and we will use this model when a few days hence we talk about what happens when light travels from air into glass or air into water or water into glass or whatever combination of things we end up looking at. So this concludes the uh, General Physics Online Lecture on standing waves and waves at boundaries. As always, if you've noticed any errors in this presentation, I would appreciate hearing about it. Thanks.